Bill had fallen in his apartment um, a couple of days ago, and no one got to him for two days, so he couldn't get off the, off the floor. A neighbor got to him. Um, his son called me this morning to tell me, and he's at the Woodlands Methodist. And so he can see visitors, so they're doing tests on him, but it just seems he just fell and just couldn't get back up. Um, so our prayers need to go out to him and that he has a quick recovery. He's just been struggling a lot physically, and then with this coming. Um, they're running tests for a stroke. I, I, I don't think that's the issue, but we'll see. I just think he fell and just couldn't get back up. And um, So be praying for him, and if you want to go see him, I'm sure he'd welcome that as well. Well, turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20. We've come to our study of Revelation 20, 1 through 10, a text dealing with the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ. A passage in the the Bible, the only passage in the Bible that tells you it's literally a thousand years. No other text does that, and that's found in Revelation 21 through 10. So rather late in the game, God tells us that it's a literal thousand year period, but late in the game or only in one passage, it's still true. So let's pray. I want to lift up Ken. Father in heaven, we, we come before your throne of grace, lifting up your servant, Ken. And Lord, you know the entire situation. You know where he is right now. And we just pray that you'll physically heal his body using the doctors that are working with him. And so we lift him up to you. And Lord, give him physical health quickly so he can continue to minister uh, in your behalf. And Lord, may we be in a... a ministry of encouragement to him, visiting him, and praying for him as well. So, Lord, we commit him and his son who's looking on. We know Ken will be going out there permanently to live near his son in Huntsville, so we just pray that you'll take care of him there as well. We lift all this up in Jesus' name. We also ask for your Holy Spirit to guide us as we study our passage today, as we look at the binding of Satan in that future time when Jesus will bind him And put him in the abyss for a thousand years. Lord, we just ask for you to guide us in this and teach us. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, let's begin by reading the text. Let's read all ten verses. John gets a, a revelation of the future and says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key to the abyss and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, And bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss. He shut it and sealed it over him so that he couldn't deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Then I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God and those who did not worship the beast or his image. And had not received the mark on their foreheads and on their hand. So these are the martyrs of the tribulation who didn't worship Satan. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. That will be the great white throne judgment at the end of the thousand years. Revelation 20, 11 through 15. But then he says this is the first resurrection referring to what he was talking about in verse 4. Blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection... Over these, the second death has no power, so no lake of fire for the believer. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him a thousand years. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison, which is the abyss, and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came upon the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, that'd be Jerusalem, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire with brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. 
So last week, we did our introduction to the theology of the millennial kingdom and briefly talked about three major views related to the millennial kingdom called millennial eschatology. So you have amillennialism, we looked at that briefly, then there's postmillennialism, and then the third one, which I hold to, is premillennialism. Um, I'm going to focus on premillennialism because that's the view that I hold, and uh, you can do more work on the other two if you wish, but I'm going to stick to the third view, the one I hold. So we noted five central interpretive issues that arise when interpreting these first six verses in Revelation 20. Number one, is the binding of Satan present or future? Is he going to be bound at a future time or is he bound now? Some views say he's bound now, and that's what this refers to. I don't believe that. I think it's future. Two, is the first resurrection of Revelation 25 through 6 spiritual or physical? In other words, is it a physical body, bodily resurrection or is one of them regeneration when you got saved? I think they're, well, we'll see soon. Number three, is the duration of the thousand years symbolic or literal? Number four, is the location of the millennial reign in heaven or on earth? And number five, is the chronology of Revelation 19, 21, going into 20, verse 1, recapitulatory, or is it sequential? Some are saying he's just going back over history again when you get to the end of chapter 19, and I think it's sequential. So I'll be focusing on the premillennial view. I think Satan's binding is future. The first resurrection will be bodily and physical. The thousand years are literal. All the numbers in Revelation are. The location of the reign will be on earth, not in heaven now. The millennium will be ruled by Jesus on the Davidic throne, on an earthly throne. The chronology is sequential. So let's go to a verse-by-verse study of this text. Have y'all been waiting for that? <laughs> some of you said, I think he was going to start that three weeks ago. Well, we did some transitional things I thought would be helpful. Now let's look at it. Oh, but before we do that, <laughs> don't forget the promise blessing for doing so. Some people avoid the book of Revelation and some that's, that they only want to study this and then they only want to study the Antichrist. What about the rest of it? Uh, there's 22 chapters in this book, and there's a blessing promised to us if we understand it. Revelation 1.3, uh, way back at the first chapter, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. So just by reading what we read today, that's part of the blessing, and we're commanded to do it. We should, we're command, commanded to know the Scripture, and we're blessed by doing so. All right, verse 1. John says, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the abyss and a great chain in his hand. So this angel that descends from heaven is unnamed. Some angels are named in the Bible, right? We got Michael, the archangel. We got Gabriel. He's a messenger. You see him in Daniel. Satan is actually, Satan gets a lot of names, doesn't he? Um, we, all, we saw one as we read this text. So some angels are named, but this one is not. But since he comes from heaven and is operating under the command and authority of God, I think he's an elect angel. Let's work on that a little because some don't agree, but we'll get to more of that in a second. So notice he comes down and he has a key to the abyss. Now, the, the Greek word, remember the Bible originally was written in Greek, the Greek word is abusos. It's translated an abyss, a deep place. Did anyone have bottomless pit? Uh, sometimes it's translated that way, but it's all this same Greek word. So we saw an angelic being in connection with the abyss back in Revelation 9, and that was in the fifth trumpet judgment. Go back to Revelation 9. I want to do some comparisons here to try to argue that the angel that uh, grabs Satan and puts him in the abyss and seals it over him is an, angel, uh, an elect angel, not a fallen angel, not Satan. 
Well, we're going to go back a little bit to the tribulation. Remember, there's three series of judgments in that last seven years before the return of Christ. You have the seven seals, you have the seven trumpets, and then following that is the seven bowls, which complete the judgment. So Revelation uh, 9.1, it says, The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth, and the key of the abyss was given to him. So John, in Revelation 9, he, <clears throat> he sees a star fall from heaven. Now, the question is, what is a star here? Well, stars are used at least three ways in the Bible. Number one, they can refer to the literal physical objects you see at night in the sky, the stars that God created. Uh, Genesis 1.16, God created the sun, the moon, and the stars. Also, Revelation 8.12 the, f the word star can refer to an asteroid or a comet, Revelation 8, 10, and 11. The second way stars are used are to describe the 12 tribes of Israel. Did you know that? Remember, in Joseph's dream of Genesis 37, it contained the sun, the moon, and 11 stars that would bow down to him, representing his mother, because you have the sun, the moon, so you have his mother, his father, and his 11 brothers. So this imagery is picked up in Revelation 12.1. You've got to know your Old Testament for the imagery in Revelation. Revelation 12.1, you're close. To the, go, go forward and look how stars is used there. He goes back to the Genesis 37 text. Revelation 12.1 says, A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. Well, that's a reference to Israel, going back to Genesis 37 and Joseph's dream, and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars for the 12 tribes of Israel. So that's another way stars can be used, but it's also, uh, it also can be used for angels. I think Job 38.7 is a reference to angels. At creation, it says, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Isaiah 14, 13, talking about Satan. But you, Satan, said in your heart, I'll ascend to heaven, I'll, I, the five I wills, you all know those. I'll raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. Now, Satan wanting to raise his throne above the stars of God could mean that he wants to rule in God's place over creation. But it could also mean that Satan wanted to rule over the angels, the stars of God. And then you get to Revelation 12, 4 and also verse 9. It says, Satan, the dragon, swept a third of the stars with his tail, which I think that shows one-third of the angelic population followed Satan in his unholy rebellion. I think that's where you get the one-third figure, which leaves two-thirds two -thirds elect angels. So we got, Jesus, we got the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit on our side, and we also have more angels than they do. How's that? So the reason this star in Revelation 9-1 is an angel and not a literal star is because it's called him. Did you notice the pronoun? The key to the abyss was given to him, and the star is called he in verse 2. He opened the bottomless pit. So this star is an intelligent being. He receives the key and uses it to unlock the abyss, which holds the demonic army. Now, some think the star whom John sees falling from heaven to the earth is an angel that God will use to advance his judgments on the earth. But again, the question does come up, is it a fallen or elect angel? The text is not specific. Some think it's Satan himself. You all know the famous prophecy scholar, Dr. John Walvoord. He said this star in Revelation 9, probably re uh, representing Satan cast out of heaven at the beginning of the Great Tribulation, Revelation 12:9 was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. Here the star, or Satan, used his key to allow demons in the abyss to come out of the earth and afflict the earth. Some even say since the star falls from heaven, it must be a fallen angel or a demon or Satan and compare it to Luke 10, 18, where Jesus said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. But I think the imagery of him falling from heaven to earth shows the origin of his descent in order to execute his mission from God on earth. Others hold this view that it's an elect angel, like Dr. Robert Thomas. He says, this star must be an unfallen angel dispatched on a divine mission to advance the next stage of God's punishment against 
excuse me, the rebellious earth. So if we compare our passage in Revelation 20 with this one, the star that falls from heaven in Revelation 9-1 is an elect angel sent from God just like chapter 20. So Revelation 9, 1 and 2, the fifth angel sounded, I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth and the key to the abyss was given to him. He opened the bottomless pit or the abyss and smoke went up out of the pit, the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. So that's, as they say when you go to the movies, coming attractions, there you go. Revelation 20, 1 through 3 He says, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, same location, holding the key of the abyss. This angel has the key to the abyss and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would deceive the nations no longer until the thousand years were complete. And after these things, he must be released for a short time. So at the fifth trumpet judgment, God uses an angel, an elect angel, to open the abyss to let the demons out on the earth. And we'll also use an angel, I think an elect angel, to see Satan and throw him into the abyss for a thousand years. This angel, if it's the same one or if it's a different one, God's using them as jailers, isn't he? Release them, put them in, and evidently, if these are elect angels or one elect angel, they're superior to the fallen angels, because we know in Revelation 12, when Michael wars with Satan's angels, who was stronger? Michael and his angels, the elect angels. So again, in 9-1 and 21-3, an angel is given the key to the abyss. What is the abyss? Well, let's talk about that a little bit. I've modified this slide a little bit from when I used it in chapter 9. I'm not going to say anything unless somebody figures it out. And then we can talk at the break. But the abyss is clearly a specific location in the underworld, which is called Hades in the Greek. The underworld is Hades, Sheol. Remember, Sheol in the Hebrew Bible can just refer to the grave. Sometimes that's all it is. We're all going to the grave, right? But sometimes Hades is not a good place. It's where unbelievers will go after they die. So during the Old Testament economy, the underworld had a location called paradise, also called what? Abraham's bosom. I take that literally from Luke 16, a place that believers went after they physically died. And who was one of those in Abraham's bosom? Abraham. (laughs) the place of safety, and it's also where the uh, poor man went after he died. The rich man was somewhere else. He was in Hades, as you see at the bottom on the other side, Luke 16, 23, and he couldn't get to Abraham and the poor man because of a great chasm between them, which is Luke 16, 26. And I think after Jesus resurrected this place where believers were in the underworld was they were transferred paradise was transferred to the third heaven and that's the interpretation my interpretation of Ephesians 4 8 remember nobody could be physically and bodily resurrected with a glorified body until Jesus had been resurrected so Ephesians 4 8 is after that resurrection so Hades is also a place has a place called torments It's used in the singular and the plural in Luke 16, where all unsaved people go after they leave this life. There's a place called Tartarus. Has anyone ever heard of Tartarus? Anyone? Which is a place of permanent imprisonment for demons until the judgment of all fallen angels, when at that time they're cast into the lake of fire. 2 Peter 2.4, Jude 6 Matthew 25, 41, Jesus says the lake of fire was prepared for the devil and his angels. So the fallen angels will eventually go to the lake of fire. But listen to 2 Peter 2, 4. Peter says, if God did not spare angels when they sinned, I think that's Genesis 6. 
but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. It seems these fallen angels committed that sin and then they were put in a place awaiting judgment and they cannot get out. Now, in your Bibles, you'll have they were cast into hell in 2 Peter 2.4. It's not the word hell. It's the word tartarao. It's a verb where we get tartarus. So to cast them into tartarus really just is one verb. So they go to this location, I think, because of the Genesis 6 issue, and now they're confined there to the final judgment. So in our passage in Revelation 9, it's focusing on the abyss, the abusos, the temporary place of imprisonment for demons, which the angel from heaven with the key will one day open up and unleash these demons on earth during the tribulation, during trumpet judgment five. And these are the, you know, the, the locusts that come out of the pit. These are fallen angels. Um, you can see that the, these locusts are released that have the power to sting like scorpions, uh, Revelation 9, 2 through 10. We've already covered that verse by verse. That's not really the focus. In Revelation 9, 11, drop your eyes there, they even have a leader over the abyss. Revelation 9, 11 says they have a king over them, the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he has the name Apollyon. Um, I think Abaddon is a high-ranking fallen angel who rules in the abyss. He's released. Oh, don't let that guy out. Well, in the name Abaddon, Avad in Hebrew, and then Apalumi in Greek is the word for destruction, to perish. Those Hebrew and Greek roots mean that. So that's his name. He doesn't get a good name, does he? So here's another angel that's named, giving a Greek and Hebrew name. Doesn't Satan have a Hebrew name? What is his Hebrew name? Satan. That one's easy to remember. It means adversary. What is his Greek name? Satanas. That's another easy one to remember. But he has other titles as well. Well, the serpent of old, the, the one who deceives the whole world, the devil, the dragon, Satan, as we just saw recently. So the abyss is also found in other passages in Revelation. Revelation 11.7, when they had finished their testimony, that's the two Jewish witnesses, that witness for the Lord. The beast, that's the Antichrist, that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. Now, the Antichrist is not actually in the abyss. Where is he? He's on earth persecuting the Jews. Satan indwells this man. And with the false prophet, they work as an unholy trinity to attack the, the people of the earth and especially Israel. So they're going to make war. He will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. So I think saying he was in the abyss, coming up out of the abyss, is highlighting the demonic nature of this man. Have you ever heard somebody say, that guy is so evil, he's from the pit of hell? Is he literally from there? No. I think this is describing how evil this Antichrist is, this one according to 2 Thessalonians 2, a man empowered by Satan to perform counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. And this is being set up right now for this, this globalism. And I, I think when the Antichrist gets it con in control of all this global technology, you're going to see some horrible stuff. And many will just follow it like nothing. So again, the abyss will one day be a prison for Satan. His temporary destiny during the millennial kingdom, because it is not the lake of fire, it's temporary. Being a prison minister for 20 years plus, it's these holding cells these guys go to before they finally go to TDC in Huntsville. They're there for a while, then they'll be released, and if they're in prison, they go somewhere if it's a life sentence. So Satan, his life sentence is the lake of fire. Pardon me. The abyss is a temporary, that's a long holding time, long time for a holding cell, a thousand years. I mean, there's nobody over a hundred years in this congregation, and doesn't it feel like an eternity? I'm 59 this month. 
That seems like a long time. You say, well, it flew by, but can you imagine being alive a thousand years? Would you want to be alive a thousand years? <clears throat> Boy, you don't look a day over 800. <laughs> so here it is. Again, let's read it. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. So we know what's down there. Satan's not there yet, but he will be. He laid hold of the dragon, one title for Satan, the serpent of old. That's coming out of Genesis 3 where the serpent came in to steal the rule from Adam, who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. And look how permanent or this is. I mean, he cannot get out. He was thrown in the abyss. It was shut over him. He sealed it over him so he couldn't deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. Does that sound like he's bound now? How do you interpret it that way? I don't get that. How does this go back over history and say, well, he must have kind of two arms behind his back, but he can't even deceive the nations any longer, and isn't he a roaring lion now seeking somebody to devour Second Peter 5.8? So I don't see this view that he's bound in any way now according to Revelation 20. But then after the end, of the thousand years, he'll be released for a short time. Then he'll go to the lake of fire, <clears throat> Revelation 20, 7 through 10. So the angel of Revelation 9, 1 and the angel of Revelation 20 both have a key to the abyss. Who gave him that key or gave them that key? Who might you think? More specific. Just stay in Revelation one seventeen and 18, when Jesus appears to John on the island of Patmos in 95 AD, John says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, and he placed his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid, I am the first and the last, the living one, and I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. In other words, I was crucified, went into the grave, and I rose from the dead. And I, Jesus says, have the keys of death and Hades. I can't find a one use in the New Testament of Hades being a good place. It's all negative. That's why I modified that slide if you didn't catch it. I'll go back to the old way I had it if you can prove it to me. But death and Hades will be raised at the great white throne and cast into the lake of fire. So let's go to verse 1 again. This angel also has a great chain in his hand. This chain will be used to bind Satan in the abyss. Now, chains in Scripture are used literally for chains used to imprison someone. Remember, Peter was put in chains when he was imprisoned in Acts 12? Verse 7 says so. Paul and Silas, remember when they're in Philippi? They were put in jail. You know the great story of the Philippian jailer. They were put in jail and then put in chains also, Acts 16, 22 through 26. So speaking of God's servants being persecuted, Hebrews 11.36 says, Others experience mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. So I think this is going to be a literal prison for Satan in the abyss. So Jesus gives the key to the abyss to this angel who is also holding a great chain. And now what happens? Verse 2 and 3. He laid hold of the dragon, so this angel obviously has more power. The serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, threw him into the abyss, and to show you how certain it was closed, he shut it and sealed it over him so that he shouldn't deceive the nations any longer, until the thousand years were complete. After these things, he must be released for a short time. So it's clear the angel takes hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, the one who's the devil and Satan. This is the exact same description from Revelation 12, 9 of Satan himself. Binds him and confines him in the abyss for a thousand years, which is the home of demons and unclean spirits as seen in Revelation 9. 
I'll show you another place in the Gospels where the abyss shows up. Go to Luke 8. Let's go read this text. A little over 10 verses. Going back to the first advent of Jesus Christ when He walked this earth. As you're turning there, I think one of the central reasons Jesus casts out demons is to show His supremacy over all His creation, including fallen angels. Because if Satan rules this world, a rule he stole from Adam in the garden, and he's presently the ruler of this world who rules the nations, and the nations are under his influence, and God told Israel, if you disobey me, the nations will be over you. Well, who else will be over them then? Satan, the ruler of the nations. So if Jesus can now come to earth, he can restore Israel to the rightful rule and put things in the proper order. Well, they, they will actually be under King Jesus. The nations will be out, uh, will not rule them. They'll actually be under Christ and in the kingdom Israel will have preeminence over the nations. So you see how Satan topsy-turvied, that's in the Hebrew. He topsy-turvied everything. So if Jesus can now cast out a demon, what is he showing the nation? I can take you out from under the power of Satan and the nations that rule you. Because he doesn't take demons out of everybody, but he does it specifically to show his power that he, like he says, if I cast out Satan by the power of Satan, then the kingdom, how, his, Satan's kingdom would be divided. He says, but if I do it by the power of the Holy Spirit, what has come upon you? The kingdom of heaven, the, the, which is the millennial kingdom he was offering. So you'll constantly see him removing demons out of people, and all he has to do is speak. The demons know who he is. They're terrified of him. Whereas some people, I don't believe Jesus is real. Really, even the devil who you worship obviously does. The demons believe he's real and we won't. His own people rejected him when he's coming to deliver them from satanic bondage. And wait till we get to the last seven years of history, how the Antichrist and the power of Satan is going to dupe most of the world. As he's doing now in his own way. So Luke eight twenty seven. So when Jesus came out onto the land, so he was in a boat. He was met by a man from the city who was possessed with demons, plural. And he had not put on any clothing for a long time and was not living in a house but in the tombs. So the, the one ruled by the author of death is hanging out where death is. So seeing Jesus, he cried out and fell before him and said in a loud voice, What business do, you, do we have with each other, Jesus? Son of the Most High God. What is this we thing? Well, he's got many demons. And he says, I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it, had, it tells it what had happened. He had, it had seized him many times, and he was bound with chains and shackles and kept under guard. Yet he would break his bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. So this man has incredible strength being demon-possessed. So Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he said, legion, which is defined as he had many demons entering him. They were, now watch what they do with Jesus. They were imploring him. They know who he is. They were imploring him not to command them to go away into the what? The abyss. They know where this place is. They don't want to go there. So now there was a herd of many swine feeding there on the mountain, and the demons implored Jesus to permit them to enter the swine. Where do they want to go? But unclean animals in Israel. Under Jewish law, they were unclean, and that's where they want to go. So unclean spirits, apropos home. And he gave them permission. So Think about this as you're looking at Satanology, angelology, demonology. Nothing can happen to you unless it passes God's hands first. Would you agree? So never say, God, where are you? You're not watching what's going on. No, He is. And they cannot do anything apart from God's permission. That's why when Job, in the book of Job, when Satan goes up to the third heaven, 
and is allowed to test Job, God put a limitation on him. You can't kill him, <clears throat> but I'll let you do this and this. So they're limited. They're obviously limited in power anyway as creatures, but they need the permission of God, so Jesus gives these demons permission. And the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and they, the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they ran away and reported all of this in the city and out in the country. So news gets out. So the people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting down at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. So removing those demons changed him. And they became frightened. And those who had seen it reported to them how the man who was demon-possessed had been made well. And look at the reaction. And all the people of the country of the Gerasenes and the surrounding district asked Jesus to leave them. You bow to him. He's the deliverer. And they were gripped with great fear, and he got into a boat and returned. So all these things Jesus is doing, the news is getting out. And sometimes there's a good response, and other times there's not. Of course, the man that got healed, he said, I'll follow you wherever you go. <laughs> good response. So Jesus, now think of this, kind of moving into this story and, and dovetailing with Jesus' ministry. Jesus, under the authority of God the Father, remember in John 8, they, they said Jesus was a Samaritan and had a demon in him. He goes, I don't have a demon in me. You're the one who worships your father, the devil. The father sent me. So Jesus is under the authority of God the Father and was able to remove unclean spirits who were under the authority of Satan and had put men into bondage. Satan could do nothing. So Jesus comes to cleanse the nation Israel and rescue her from her captivity, namely an enslavement to Satan through the nations that Satan uses against Israel. And at that time, who was the nation he was using? The Roman Empire, the fourth part of the statue of Daniel 2. And what did Isaiah 61 prophesy? The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, the Messiah. So the Holy Spirit was anointing the Messiah sent from God the Father. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty or freedom to the captives and freedom to prisoners. Was the whole nation of Israel in a jail? No, they're under the enslavement of the nations who are ruled by Satan, and he came to remove that. And when Jesus quotes this in Luke 4, the, the nation Israel went into a rage and wanted to kill him when he claimed that he was the Messiah fulfilling Isaiah 61. What they could have had. <clears throat> How about Hebrews 2, 14 and 15? Does, does Satan have people in bondage? Well, it says, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he, Jesus himself, likewise partook of the same. So he, God became flesh. That through, the, through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. So those under the bondage of Satan in unbelief that are unsaved, if they believe in Christ, they'll be set free. Amen? Why won't people believe in him when their other alternative is to keep rejecting him and end up in the lake of fire forever? That doesn't sound like a good option. Why not believe in Jesus and have the penalty of sin removed from you, and one day he will resurrect you and bring you into the kingdom? So rather than Israel recognizing Jesus as their capable deliverer and seeking his deliverance, the people out of fear told Jesus to leave in Luke 8, which reflects the heart of the nation. However, one day Jesus will call, well, when the Jews call on Jesus, they'll call on his name for deliverance or salvation. Jesus will return to earth and the tables are going to completely turn. Jesus will deliver Israel from satanic bondage, the worst ever in their history, Satan, the Antichrist, and the wicked nations, and the false prophet. 
Satan being the enslaver of mankind, he'll be bound in chains and then Jesus will cleanse the nation and rule his kingdom of peace. And then at the end of that, he'll hand, put Satan in the lake of fire where the beast and false prophet are, and then he'll hand the kingdom over to the Father, 1 Corinthians 15. Then we'll see the eternal state. Y'all getting this? Well, I'll close here. If you've never put your faith in Christ, if he doesn't come back for 100,000 years, you better do it because you're not going to live that long, right? No one in this room will be here in 100 years. I think that's fair to say. Probably a lot of us will be gone way before that. So you have a chance in this life to be saved from the penalty of sin. And God only provided one Savior. I heard another guy pre when I was preaching in the jail last week that God wants, Jesus told us to love everybody. I agree. But he said all roads basically lead to heaven. No matter what God you serve, what religion. Religion is made of man and it divides people. I agree, but there's only one way. There's only one Savior and you can't say you can get there any other way. Because Jesus said, I didn't say it, I'm repeating him. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. No one comes to the Father except through Edemidimu, except through me. Me is singular. How many ways? Acts 4, 12. There's no name given under heaven to men by which we must be saved in the name of Jesus Christ. But the only way he could save us is because of what he did. So God had to become flesh because the problem requires a divine solution. So God becomes flesh because the sin problem is human, so he had to become a man. Do you have anything else among the religions like that? Nope, nothing. We're not, it's not the same God, not even close. Everyone's saying, oh, it's the same God, not, not even close. Ask any of the other religions, Islam and all of them, all I got to do is start with this. Do you believe in the Trinity? No, we got a different God. You just told me it's the same God, and now you already disagree with me in half a second. Is Jesus eternal God become flesh? No, we got a different Savior. Did he go to the cross and die for the sins of the world? Some will say no. I mean, we have a different God than these other religions, and Satan is getting us to accept all of them as, as okay. Now, should we love all men and give them the gospel? Absolutely. That's our mission, to give the good news of Jesus Christ. And so as a man, God becomes flesh. He hangs on the cross for six hours. The first three hours, he's receiving the wrath of man. They're hurling insults at God's Son. But then in the middle of that six hours, God covers the hill in darkness. Now from 12 noon to 3, God's going to pour out the sins of the world, all of yours, all of mine, the whole Everyone from Adam to the last person on earth, he will pour out every single sin on his son as our substitute. And it says, Jesus bore our sins in his own body on the cross. So after he finishes it, doesn't, doesn't he say, to Telestai, it is finished? He completes the sacrifice, he goes into the grave, and he raises from the dead. And now the call is to believe in him. The Philippian jailer said, what must I do to be saved? Well, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But if you choose not to, John 3.18 says, he who does not believe or he who believes is not judged, but he who does not believe stands judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. John 3.36, if you don't believe in him, the wrath of God abides on you. It remains on you. So take the way of escape while you still can. When I was young, I always thought, well, it'll probably be a long time before I die because I was young. But I've seen funerals for people under 10 years old with teenagers, 20-year-olds. So you don't know how much time you have. And I thank God He allowed me to live to see age 26 when I came to faith. So don't play around and say, well, I'll get to that later. I've got other things to do. 
Do you realize if you put your faith in Christ, you are saved eternally and permanently at that, at that very second? God, if somebody says, do you, ha- do you have a minute? No, nah, not a minute. Do you have a second to just believe in him? Take it and, and go. Now, he wants you to live for him in the time you're still here. He wants you to walk with him and walk by the Spirit and minister to him because we're here for him. Ultimately, that's the main reason we're still here. I still have 14 minutes left. I could open it for questions, but that would be a dangerous thing for any pastor to do. Well, we'll close a little early, and let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, once again, how many hundreds of times have you allowed us to just come here together and worship you? to live another day, to learn about you and apply your word, to represent you. As your servant Paul said, you gave him the word. You were once darkness, now you're light in the Lord, so walk as children of light. Lord, as believers in Jesus Christ, we're not under Satan's dominion. We're not his children. We are actually sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus and We are now light in the Lord. We know if Jesus is light, in Him we are light. But then you call us to walk as children of light. And we know we still have the flesh, and if if we fail, we can choose to walk by the sinful nature, grieve the Spirit, but you want us to walk by the Spirit and not gratify the desires of the flesh, and you want the fruit of the Spirit to abound in our lives, the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, the gentleness, the faithfulness and self-control, because you said against these things there's no law. So may we do that in the time that we have until you come back for us. So Lord, we pray for anyone who has never believed in Jesus Christ that they would make that decision and at that moment receive eternal life. So Lord, we'll commit our time to you in Jesus' name, amen.